Hi, my name is Connie Kalkanis and you're watching a video on the characteristics of convergence and sufficiency. Okay, what is convergence and sufficiency? It is an anomaly of convergence where the patient cannot undertake convergence and remain symptom free. So normally you should be able to converge your eyes to the nose or to around six centimetres. So where a patient has reduced convergence, so a uh, a CMP or convergence near point of less than 10 centimetres, the patient may have CI or convergence insufficiency. Now, in order for the patient to be diagnosed with CI, they must have the reduced convergence near point with symptoms. Okay, other things that may happen is that the patient may demonstrate good CMP um, initially, but with repeated measurement, it begins to recede. So these patients having difficulty maintaining convergence or uh, when the patient attempts to converge at a normal distance like six centimeters they're struggling to do so it's done so with effort and with symptoms so overall convergence insufficiency is a convergence uh, anomaly where um, the patient is symptomatic and that is key we cannot classify a patient who just has reduced cmp with no symptoms as having CI. In terms of classifying the patient, there are two types of convergence insufficiency, primary and secondary. Primary means that we cannot find an underlying reason for why the patient has CI. Secondary, on the other hand, means there is an underlying reason as to why the patient has CI. Primary convergence insufficiency is the most common. And the reason we're discussing it with uh, exophorias and exodeviation is because it's usually associated with an exophoria. Not always, but, but often. However, the exophoria noticed in primary CI is relatively insignificant. And here we have a couple of figures uh, that suggest that there isn't a secondary underlying um, exodeviation leading to the CI. So in the distance, around three or four doctors or less than three or four doctors is considered normal. And then at near, um, up to about eight doctors is fine. But it's worth noting here that if your patient's um, convergence is very remote, so say it's beyond a third of a metre, then this will translate into usually the patient having an exotropia at near. Um, so an intermittent exotropia in the presence of CI. Now, as I mentioned earlier, secondary CI will be related to some underlying cause that you found. It could be uh, accommodation, so we're looking at presbyopia or refraction uh, as being an issue, in which case, obviously, you would uh, manage that to see whether the CI would improve. And then there could be ocular motility disorders or other conditions that are known to be associated with CI, such as Parkinson's disease. Now, in terms of patients presenting to you in clinic, generally they can present at any age. More often, they present um, either after early adolescence or in their 20s or 30s. But they can present at any age in childhood and obviously in um, adults of presbyopic age and beyond. Now, typically, these patients will present to you with symptoms, asthenopic symptoms, and they're not sure what's causing their symptoms. And they may have even seen like a neurologist for headaches and they've been cleared of any causes for headaches and therefore they're now looking at the possibility of uh, the eyes being related to the symptoms. Now in terms of symptoms, generally they're very similar to that which we see in decompensating exophoria patients. Uh, they'll have headaches and these are synopic symptoms of eye strain, uh, difficulty uh, focusing and potentially diplopia. Again, remember diplopia means that they've become intermittently exotropic or have a manifest deviation at times. Okay, one that may not make sense to you is there I have words jumping across page. So a patient may complain that the words are jumping across the page. Uh, this is for patients who uh, break down uh, during reading. So you're, you're at a near distance and you're utilizing convergence and all of a sudden um, the, the eyes break or the patient can no longer maintain convergence. At that point, if the patient flips into being suppressed because they become manifest, then what will happen is the words will appear as if they've jumped because you're going from a binocular view when the patient is BSV to a uniocular view 
uh, when the patient um, does not have BSV. And the way in which a patient may describe this is that the wounds are jumping across the page. This doesn't happen with patients who have diplopia. Generally, they'll just describe that they have intermittent diplopia. Uh, this is for patients who are suppressing on break or when they become manifest. Again, these are going to be patients with remote CMPs who have extremely reduced convergence near points and are breaking down into having a manifest deviation, usually an exo deviation. Okay, so what do we expect to find in our clinical investigation of a patient with convergence insufficiency? Here I've listed a series of tests that will assist you in diagnosing the patient as having convergence insufficiency. This isn't a complete set of investigations. Clearly, you'll do visual acuity, um, or you'll assess the patient's visual, visual acuity, you'll assess the patient's ocular movements, and all those should be normal. So, so what I'm concentrating on here is uh, findings that will be anomalous and will be highlighting that the patient has CI. So firstly, the cover test. We mentioned earlier that they often have an exophoria, but not always, and that usually is of an insignificant amount. However, should you find that the convergence near point is very remote, then you may have an exotropia at near, and this will mean that you generally have a convergence weakness exodeviation. So an exodeviation that's greatest or greater at near as compared to far because convergence is more required at near. So obviously one of the key components of diagnosing convergence is looking at the convergence near point. And to do this, we use the RAF gauge, which you can see here to the right. And we would ask the patient to look at the dot just there and tell us the point at which they see two dots. Now, obviously you'll be objectively viewing the eyes to see when they stop converging. And this is important because some patients will experience diplopia on break, whilst other patients will not experience diplopia. In other words, they've suppressed. They're the patients who may have that jumping of words on the page. Now, for some patients, the convergence near point may be reasonable, but what you will note is that it deteriorates with repeated measurements. So after you um, assess it the second or third time, it goes from being 10 centimetres to 14 centimetres to 20 centimetres as an example. Or the other possibility is that the patient uh, can converge to quite close to their nose, but then what happens is that they're struggling to maintain that and they become um, symptomatic or you notice that there's great effort being put into maintaining uh, single vision at that point. Now, in measuring the convergence near point with the RAF gauge, all we're doing is measuring the slow or smooth um, pursuit component of convergence. It is worthwhile also assessing jump convergence, so having the patient look into the distance and then very quickly at near to see how accurately and comfortably they can change their convergence. And we do this because we have exercises that can deal with issues with jump convergence. Okay, accommodation is a good idea to assess in patients with um, CI or who you suspect have CI. And the reason is that if you compare the uniocular accommodation with the binocular accommodation, it can give you some indications to whether this is a accommodative problem or a convergence issue that the patient has. So again, with the RAF gauge, you assess accommodation. And in this instance, you can't see it here, but you get the patient to look at the letters and ask them when they first blur. And so uniocularly, you would do it right and left separately, and then binocularly, both eyes open. And if the patient has CI, generally the uniocular accommodation will be significantly better than the binocular accommodation. So it's when you ask the patient to do binocular convergence with both eyes open that the accommodation is more reduced. And so this is highlighting that it's a, probably a convergence issue rather than accommodation issue. So the opposite of that is a patient who has better binocular accommodation versus uniocular accommodation, that's telling you probably you have an underlying accommodation issue and that any um, convergence of sufficiency that you see is not primary, it's secondary. The other possibility is that you find that accommodation is reduced for the patient's age. This doesn't really highlight whether um, the CI is primary or secondary, uh, but you will end up assessing this as you assess the patient's binocular accommodation. Okay, and lastly, prism fusion range. Often patients with CI will have a reduced uh, fusional convergence as compared to their fusional divergence, which is generally normal.
Okay, so the key component in diagnosing a patient with uh, convergence insufficiency is the assessment of convergence and the convergence near point. And we do this using the RAF gauge because it is an instrument that we can utilise to get reliable, repeatable measurements. The other tests, the cover test accommodation and prism fusion range, support your finding from the CNP in terms of diagnosing the patient with CI and assist you to determine whether it's primary or secondary. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.